them in there um, and I'll try and answer those at the end. But if not, the contact details for my team and myself are going to be at the end of the slide. So if you do have any questions um, after this, then just pop us, drop us an email. Um, so just to introduce you, so this is the John Chambers team. So as I said, I'm, I'm Georgia, I'm the technical manager here. Um, you've got Jason, who is our production manager, Roger, who's the business manager, uh, Mark, who is the business director, and you've got Emily, who is our JC advisor as well. So we're a reasonably small team. Um, so if you do have any inquiries that go to our main sales email, you will hear back from, from one of us. So we are here today, um, obviously, to talk about autumn sowing. So there is in wildflower seed, there is uh, two sowing seasons. So your autumn sowing season is ideally the best time to sort of sow and start getting these uh, new wildflower areas established. So, so we say that this uh, sowing season runs from September to October. Um, and we have had a frost overnight up here in Yorkshire. I don't know about any of you guys uh, sort of where you are in the country. So we would sort of advise starting to stop sowing um, in the next sort of week or so, just because any more harsh frosts can make it uh, difficult for any seed to go down. Um, but there are benefits to sowing in autumn in comparison to spring. Um, a lot of the wild perennial seed species uh, that we supply do have quite hard shell coatings. So when you sow in the autumn period, over the winter, those seeds have a process um, of freezing and thawing, which basically then cracks their seed coatings. And what that does is it just um, gives better germination than when it starts warming up and you come into springtime. Those, those species, their seed coatings have cracked. So actually when the warmer weather gets to them, um, they tend to germinate a little bit better than if you were to sow in, in springtime. Um, but don't worry, we can, you know, autumn sowing, it's not, sometimes sites don't allow for sowing at this time of year. If we have uh, weather like we did last year, it just rained from basically September all the way to Christmas, it feels like. So a lot of sites will push back. Um, so there are things we can do for spring sowing as well. And there will be another webinar probably in the springtime to discuss spring sowing then. So mixture choice this is your first sort of decision um, that you need to make when you are choosing to do a new wildflower area um, there are several different ways of looking at which mixture to choose uh, i'll go through a few of the ways that we recommend recommend seed mixtures um, but there's a few things to sort of consider um, as to obviously which species are going to suit your area the best but then also what you want to get out of of your area as well are you replanting an area so it um you know it holds a good ecological value are you doing it for the wildlife or are you doing it um in the middle of a city center so it needs to be really attractive for the public you need to think about why you're wanting to introduce this area as well but the first thing we would say to a uh, factor to look at is the soil type that you've got on your site so if you have um a particular extreme soil so if you know you've got really heavy clay that um, is really dense in the winter time it gets a lot of water uh, or if you've got a really sandy soil um, particularly by the coast um, or if you've got a new, really nutrient rich soil so you've got a site that has previously been farmland and it's got a lot of fertilizer um, and nitrogen rich soil in there that's the first thing to sort of look at don't worry too much we don't sort of um, say that you need to get your soil tested it's just whether you've got a real extreme that can then help us to narrow down which species are going to suit that soil a little bit more. The next factor is um, your environmental conditions. So have you got an area that is in full shade? Is it in um, a woodland area or is it in full sun? Um, is it on a you know full sun on a slope? Does it get really dry in the summertime? Um, is it by the coast? Does it need to, um, does the area need to be able to tolerate sort of salt spray coming off the sea? Um, or is this in an urban area? Is this up on a 60 foot, you know, green roof um, right in the middle of a city? So it needs to be tolerant of, of those kinds of conditions there. And then the last focus is, um, have you got a conservation focus? So is there a type of species that you're trying to introduce or reintroduce into an area? So do you know an area you've got, um, you have bats present on site? Uh, potentially looking at planting species that attracts the moth to the area, which in turn attracts the bats to the area. So is that your focus in, instead? And finding a mixture that um, meets all three of those 
criteria is obviously a little bit tricky but what we sort of say is use one of those focuses and look at which one is is taking more of the lead on it so if you know you do have a really heavy clay soil it's likely that we need to recommend a mixture that's going to suit that soil best um, and the environment and the the conservation can sort of come after that so the types of mixtures um, we normally provide are either include or don't include grass in there uh, so you've got your traditional hay meadow mixture which will be eight to minutes or you've got 100 percent flower mixtures uh, so the species that are included in those are obviously mixed and designed differently to meet those different factors um, but your first one is obviously your 100 percent wildflower seed mixture so this is just a seed mix that is all wildflowers um, and these have been designed to meet the conditions that we've we've just spoken about so you've got your 100 percent clay soils mixture which will be a range of um, 20 to 30 wildflower species that are tolerant of of clay soil conditions um, when we're designing mixtures we look at where those species of wildflower naturally thrive in the wild um, so when, for instance, when we're designing a hedgerow mixture, the base of it we, we have had um, sort of designed for years, but actually we will look at how those species thrive in those hedgerow conditions. We get asked quite a lot about um, what's the difference between a, a woodland and a hedgerow mixture. And there is a lot of crossover between the two, but actually a woodland seed mixture is more tolerant of more moist soils. Um, so found in sort of deep woodland and a hedgerow mixture is has species in there that are more tolerant of, of drier conditions because the hedgerow is creating that because there's so much other uh, shrubs and trees and vegetation there. Your next type of mixture is 100% um, native annual mixtures. So these are really great to include if you want to ensure that you are going to have first year flowering. Um, so the species in these are sort of native and naturalised species that have been here for, for decades. So your, your common poppy, um, your blue cornflower, your ca corn chamomile and, and corn marigold. There's a few of those featured in that, in that photo. Um, and these are really, these always go down well with the public because they are bright, um, flowery, native mixtures. Your next uh, mixture type is... 100% impact annual mixtures. So our impact range that we sell here at John Chambers um, is the only range of seed we do that does contain some garden varieties and non-native species. These are still um, pollen and nectar rich species, but they've also been designed to be um, very impactful. So a lot of bright colours. Um, we've got quite a big range of these and these go down really well with the public on sort of roundabouts when you're driving into um, a new town and city. They do need resowing each year, um, but we find that a lot of councils use these because instead of sowing a rabbit, it's not quite every four weeks, take a pot seed just like this down. And actually, because they're designed to flower from, you know, even earliest May time, right the way through to the end of the season, it cuts down on, on maintenance that you need to do because you can just leave it to flower. Um, I'll come on to maintenance of all the different mixtures um, in a little while. So the last one is your grass and wildflower mixtures. Um, so this is what we would say is your traditional hay meadow um, mix. So it's normally 80% grass and 20% wildflower. Um, we can design these slightly differently. So if your soil type is quite high in um, nutrients, and we know that it's been previously a field with a lot of um, nitrogen fertilizer use, we would actually recommend decreasing the ratio of grass in there and increasing the wildflower. Um, grass and wildflower mixtures, when you're first establishing them, do need quite a bit of maintenance. And that maintenance ensures that the wildflowers can establish in the grass area without the grasses becoming too um, vigorous and outcompeting the wildflowers that are there. So that's why we would suggest if you have a high uh, nutrient soil to just decrease that ratio slightly to maybe a 50-50 mix, just to give the wildflowers an extra, extra hand in establishing. They're not always the strongest of growers, aren't wildflowers. So although they do suit well with um, sort of fescue grasses after they've established, they need a little, little bit of help um, to begin with. You could look at these mixtures and sort of add them together. So you're first initial 
perennial mix. Um, you can add annuals to that to ensure sort of first year um, colour because a lot of the perennial species will take the first year to get themselves established so they might not flower. Um, so adding annuals into that is a really good way of, of making sure that you're getting flowering in the, in the first season. So you've looked at your conditions, you've chosen a seed mixture, um, so then you need to prepare the area. So we always recommend sort of when you are starting a new area, starting from scratch and removing the vegetation that's there. Um, so removing the grass, other weed species that are over there in the soil already. We're aware that obviously this isn't um, feasible to do it on every single site. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you later about sowing into already established areas. But preparation with removing everything that is there is the most efficient way of getting those species established because you are removing any other competition that's already in the soil, um, especially with quite vigorous weeds. They will just outgrow any of the wildflowers. As I said, they're not the strongest of growers. So removing them, um, those weed species and grass species just really gives them the, the sort of help they need. Um, so when you've cleared your soil, um, you want to sort of rake the soil over and just create sort of a fine till for it to be sown into. Um, and then you want to sow your seed. So if you are sowing just an 100% perennial mixture, you just want two grams per square meter. If you are sowing a perennial mixture with your annuals, so your, your cornflowers, your poppy, um, you want to up that sowing rate just to three grams per square meter. Your 80-20 mixes are five grams a square meter and your 50-50 mixes, so 50% grass, 50% wildflower, are about four grams um, per square meter. So it's not a massive amount of seed certainly not in comparison to sowing a new amenity lawn, for instance, but because of the different um, seeds per gram rates for the different wildflowers, you don't actually need a lot of seed at all. Um, species like poppy will have up to sort of 10,000 um, seeds per gram in there. So if you imagine you're sowing more than sort of one to two grams, you're gonna end up with quite a lot of species, um, species growing. So it is a, a lower sowing rate than normal. Uh, so depending on which your mixture is, you obviously want to sow at the recommended sowing rate. If um, sowing's been done over quite a large area and you are using machinery to do it, so either a hand sower or a, a walking sower, they sometimes will need something adding to bulk out um, the mixture because the sowing rate on the machine doesn't go down to low enough of what we would recommend for sowing. So if you sow in 100% over you know, an acre, um, you might need to add some sand into your machine to be able to do it. Um, sand doesn't need to be anything special. It just needs to be in a, it's literally just a carrier for the seed. Um, but it can be a good thing to use as well because it gives you a visual aid of, of where you've obviously sown your seed. Some of this seed is really, really tiny. Um, and actually it doesn't, you might not be able to see where you've already sown. So using sand can be a really good visual aid too. So after you've sown your seed um, onto your bare earth, you want to then roll the seed in. Um, you can even stamp it in if you've only got a small area to do. And what that does is it just pushes the seed just into the top surface of the um, soil and just gives it really good contact. If you can, quite easily done in, in the UK, if you can plan to do your sowing just before you know it's gonna rain, then that again, um, is ideal just because the rain sort of washes that seed in a little bit further. The soil doesn't need any, um, the area doesn't need any soil on top of it uh, covering that after. If you think about wildflower species in the wild, when they are dispersing their seed, they're not getting, it's, the seed isn't getting buried under the ground. And because the perennial species are quite hard and, and, and tough shell coatings, they actually need to be sort of exposed to the elements slightly. Um, so it doesn't need to be covered with anything. The only thing we do get asked at this point is if you have a lot of birds in the area, what you would do about that? Does it need to be covered by a netting? Um, you could cover it by a netting, but obviously that's not always feasible for massive areas. You could just put um, an additional sort of 10% of seed down just to make sure if the birds do get um, any of it, then you've still got plenty there. So your area over the next season has, has thrived, it's doing really well. So then you need to know what you're doing to maintain the area. So maintenance of 100% seed mixtures are a lot less uh, than in comparison to whether you've got grass there. 
Um, and these, if you've sown in autumn or spring, you basically just want to cut the area back at the end of the, the growing season. Depending on what, which mixture you've gone for, you should be able to tell when an area has gone over. So these stems will be um, dried, they'll have gone sort of brown, and you'll be able to see some of the seed um, in the stems as well. So when you're cutting back your cuttings, you can leave them to lay for sort of one to two days just to let any other seeds drop out and fall back into the soil. But after that, we would always say to remove your cuttings from the site. Um, this is because you don't want the cuttings rotting down and adding any more nutrients to the soil because if there are species of grass or weed in there, it will the extra nutrients will only feed them um, and let them grow um, easier so it becomes a more competitive uh, area for your wildflowers. Obviously, not all sites are perfectly ac accessible. Um, so when a cut has been done and you can't remove the cuttings, you can do what we say is to leave sort of habitat heaps. So you leave the cuttings in a pile to the side of the site um, and birds and mice will use that as sort of nesting material. But obviously after a while, this is gonna start building up. So you just want to be aware that you probably are gonna need to get rid of them at some point. Your 80-20 maintenance, so this is your grass and wildflower maintenance, needs a little bit more um, because you need to make sure that your wildflowers are establishing within the grass seed that's there. So in the first year, um, so you've sown in the autumn, it's had um, a winter to sort of establish itself. So in the springtime, looking from sort of May time to early June, from this point to the end of the season, the whole area will need cutting back sort of every three to four weeks through that growing season. And what that does is it just knocks the grasses back and allows sort of enough air and light to get into the sward. With your perennial mixtures, um, the perennial species will probably put out a small amount of foliage, um, not nothing very tall, and they probably won't flower in the first year anyway, because they are focusing their energies on putting their root system down. So when you're cutting back the area, um, you won't damage them at all, that they should be absolutely fine, but it ensures that enough light and air is getting in there so that they can establish themselves. At the end of your the season, so September, October time, um, you're gonna do the, the cut, um, remove your cuttings, and then leave the area over the winter period. If we've had quite a mild winter, um, which sometimes we do, and you get to the following spring, so your second year spring, um, and you think the, the grasses have really grown, but not a lot else is sort of showing through, you can do what we call a, a cleaning cut. So you basically cut the area uh, back down um, to about 75 mil or sort of second to highest setting on the mower. And what that does, it'll just re reburst the, the sward. So I encourage those wildflower species to come back. When you're doing your cuts, you want to cut it back to between 75 and, and 100 mil um, just to really kind of get it back down to um, encourage new growth coming through. The maintenance that I've talked about so far is maintenance of um, a perfect season, a perfect year. And actually in reality with our climate changing, when we're seeing that we need to offer advice on, on different maintenance um, throughout the season because the weather can massively affect how a meadow does look. So when we've had years where the, we've had a really warm or hot May um, and June, actually what that does for a lot of the species is it, it pushes them forwards and they flower and go over a lot earlier. In the year, um, which can mean that an area sometimes has gone over in July and people are really not looking back right now. Uh, is there anything I can do? At that point, if we have had strange weather and the meadow isn't looking how you want it, just give us a call and we can recommend what to do at that point. Um, obviously, it might be that we recommend halfway through the year that you do give it a cut back, remove your cuttings, and some of the faster flowering, faster establishing perennials will come back through and flower again. Um, but it depends on what time of year it is. Uh, we've also had years where actually we've had really cold starts to the season. So the spring's been particularly damp and cold and it's really not started to get warm. Uh, when I say warm, I mean, 
over 10 degrees to sort of May time. Um, and what's that that has meant is that actually it's it's lengthened out that spring season. So actually nothing has really shot up and started growing until a lot later. And then what that means is it, it pushes the season back. So some areas are still flowering in sort of October time. Um, so again, in, in that scenario, we would just say wait and let the warmth really um, shoot the area back up. Um, and then in October time, if the area is still flowering late September and you can't, you know, you've still got flowers, then just leave it until it has gone over. Um, you can obviously cut it, but you want to let the flowers sort of go to seed. If it gets to sort of late October, we would recommend cutting it back at that point. But if the flowering is still happening in September, then by all means, leave it. Um, so the other method of establishing areas <clears throat> excuse me is to sow into something that's already there so we've been getting asked about how the best best methods of doing this are a lot more now since um, biodiversity net gain has come into practice because people are becoming aware of not being able to get rid of completely what's there if you do have a difficult site um so we've come up with a few different methods of doing this and each one does give quite varying results but it will um take a little bit longer than sort of starting an area from from um, scratch so the first option is to introduce yellow rattle so yellow rattle is the species on on screen now it's quite a small species um but what yellow rattle is is it's known in the industry as sort of the, the meadow maker it's in the vast majority of our mixtures um, and it's actually semi-parasitic. So what it does is it, it latches onto grass seed roots and strips some of the moisture out of them. Um, so it, it actually prevents the grasses from growing as tall and as vigorously as, as they have done. And in turn, what that means is it, it opens up the sward so it lets other wildflowers that aren't as strong growing um, come through and, and, and flourish. With yellow rattle, we would always recommend sowing this in the autumn. Um, the germination of yellow rattle seed does decrease quite rapidly over the year. So we'd always recommend using fresh seed in the autumn, uh, which we now have available. The harvest is in for yellow rattle. It's usually an earlier harvest. It's sort of an August harvest, this one. Um, you want to sow at about 0.5 to one gram per square meter. There's not a, a massive amount needed. Um, and ideally, you would want to leave that an entire season for it to get established. So sow it in autumn and then the following autumn. And um, by that point, it will have hopefully germinated, flowered, thrived and got a hold of those grasses. Then in that following autumn, you can then look at introducing and sowing more species into the area at that point. Um, you can do this as plug plants as well. So plug planting them in little clumps of an area and um, that does work and is quite an efficient way of, of doing it um, because you know that you already have the plug established. So you know that you're not having to worry about this, the seed germinating because it can be a little bit difficult um, it wants particular conditions for this to, to germinate. Um, if you haven't got time or you know you are pushed for time on site, you can sow the yellow rattle alongside a, a seed mixture but the results for this aren't going to be as good as they would be if you leave it for a year um, and, and let it get established option two is to sow a wildflower mixture into an established area that's already there so if you've got a an old paddock let's say with lots of uh, fescues already in there um, what we would recommend is look at the area if there's any huge clumps of, of grass, pull those out, ideally. Um, and then you basically want to go over the area with a mower and cut it to as short as possible. If possible, then either scarify the area or just um, basically rake over the area so you've got patches of bare soil available. Don't worry about scarifying too much because the grass roots are there, so they will pop up back through eventually and um, you're not going to damage them too badly at all and then what you would do is you would sow 100% wildflower seed into that area um, but then you would follow the maintenance guide of an H20 mixture so you would sow 100% wildflower but actually you're going to treat it as a grass and, wash and wildflower area so you sow it in this in the autumn and that following spring you're going to be doing your cuts every three to four weeks through that through that main growing season. And what that does is it lets 
obviously the wildflowers establish while the grasses are there. As I said, this does give quite varying results um, and it's probably better to try it with sort of a, a general purpose wildflower mixture um, to start with because those species are tolerant of a little bit more uh, of sort of tougher conditions. Um, and if you can pull up patches of bare soil completely, then then do that too. But obviously, when you're talking about areas that are quite extensive, it's, it's not always feasible um, to be able to pull everything up that's there. And then your third and final option is to basically plug plant into an area. Um, this is a really good way of establishing specific species into there. So we recommend planting plugs when someone is looking to introduce species that um, either the seed in itself is quite expensive or it's quite um, it needs quite a few seasons to get them get it established. So species like um, cowslip and primrose do really well as, as plug plants because um, primrose seed is very difficult to get hold of um, and they can be a little bit temperamental with, with germinating. So we recommend sowing these as, as plugs quite often. When you're sowing your plug plants, you can either choose, um, we have packs available. So if you wanted to choose like um, a plug plant pack that's attractive for butterflies, we would send you a pack of a minimum of 10 different species. And all those species are attractive to, uh, to butterflies. Or if you know you need specific species going into the site, we can price them individually. Um, so if you did want cowslip or uh, field scabious, for instance, we can price those individually. When you're planting your plugs in the area, um, you want to basically dig a slightly bigger hole than um, the plug actually needs just to remove a little bit of the vegetation that's around the area. You pop your plug in, um, put the soil back over it, and you want to also plant them in, in sort of clumps of a few together. Um, so if you did this across a field, then basically what you'd find eventually is once everything becomes established and is flowering, uh, these they will flower and they'll spread their seed um, across the site. So again, it, it does take a lot longer to establish things this way. But if you are looking at introducing um, plugs into the area, this is a really good way of, of, of doing it because it ensures that you're not having to wait for the, the seed to sort of to germinate. Um, we have got yellow rattle plugs available as well. Um, but just a note that if you are looking at that plug option, these are the only plugs that will actually arrive with some grass seed in there because when you are growing yellow rattle, you need to give them some grass seed to germinate on, whereas all other plugs will arrive sort of as an individual, um, as an individual species. So hopefully that has given you sort of a brief overview of um, how to choose your sort of mixtures, um, how to sow them, your maintenance for after, um, Obviously, there's probably a few of you that have got questions, um, but just let us know. I'm just going to check the um, chat to see if there are questions. Yeah, what we are going to do with the slides after. So this um, webinar is being recorded um, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, I believe. So I will send the link out um, afterwards. So for any of you that have missed parts of it or just want to go over parts of it, then it will be available. Um, you can leave some areas uncut for insects over the winter, um, especially for sort of winter birds as well. So species like teasel and wild carrot, they birds really like in the winter period because the, the seed on them they'll use um, and some of the um, materials, so the, the stems, once they've dried out, they'll actually use them as nesting materials. So you can leave areas over the winter too, um, if, if allowed, obviously, on some sites, it's not. People prefer to cut it back and sort of give it some some green coverage over the winter. Um, just have a look. Um, for very wet or damp sites, we've got a couple of mixtures um, that we could recommend. So it depends on where it's going. We've got sort of like a wetland mixture that you could put and use around obviously a pond. Um, we've also got a new swale mixture that we've designed. So um, we've had to design a swale mixture because that's been 
asked for quite a lot for sites where it is flooding in the winter period, but actually because of the clay soil that's there is becoming really dry and cracked in the in the summer periods. Um, or we've got a, if you've just got a quite a damp soil, um, we've also got sort of a wet and damp soils mixture as well. Um, but I can send details of that across afterwards. Um, bulbs, again, I didn't mention them today just because it, I had to keep it sort of quite brief. Um, but bulbs are a really good way of extending the flowering period over over the entire year. So there is bulbs you can introduce that will obviously start flowering in January, um, right up until your first sort of species of sort of cowslip primrose come through in in sort of April time. Um, so we've got all the native ones available. Um, your winter aconite, um, your bluebell, your native narcissus. Um, they are all available now as dried bulbs and we do actually have them available as in the green in the springtime too. So if you've missed planting them in, in the autumn period, we have them available so you can plant them as, as actual plants in the, in the springtime too. But they're a really good way of ensuring that pollinators have um, early pollen to, to get access to while you're waiting for your full meadow to, to sort of come through. Um, just in a question regarding creeping buttercup, it can be a little bit difficult to manage um, because it's one species that once it's happy in a certain area, it can become um, quite dominant. But with any of the wildflower species, um, the best thing to do is to is to manage them as if they are becoming a little bit invasive. Um, so we get asked a lot about this with, with Oxide Daisy as well. Because that one, when it settles in and it can become quite fuggish and, and sort of take over. Um, the thing to do with it doesn't just any more seed uh, because we'll stop it from obviously more of it uh, growing. The second thing is to obviously remove what's there. Um, there's several ways you can do that depending on area size and what you have access to. Um, obviously, spraying it, it's not everybody's uh, preferred method, but that would be your, your most efficient way of removing what's there. Um, you can manually remove it and just get as much root out as possible. Um, if you are going to do it manually, then you need to make sure you, you're giving yourself um, a realistic time frame as well, because even if you think you've got rid of the whole root, there might still be plants or seed in the in the soil that will come through and, and carry on growing. So it might be a bit of a, a labor of love to get rid of that one. Um, just keep keep removing it, um, not letting it flower and, and go from there. Um, there is a mixture for shady areas. So when we're um, recommending areas or recommended mixtures for shady areas, we would always ask whether your soil is more moist or whether it is more dried, um, just because if it's more dried from sort of large trees taking up quite a bit of the moisture in the in the area, we would say to go for a hedgerow mixture. If your soil is more damp, um, you know, it's in the bottom of a woodland near a small river or something, we would say go for a woodland mix. There will be quite a bit of crossover between the two anyway, um, but it, it should be, if you kind of stick to that, then, then that should be um, okay. With shady, um, or woodland species of wildflower, I should mention that these species in particular can take quite a few years to germinate and establish, um, which is why we recommend doing other things like planting bulbs or planting plugs as well. So although we do include bluebell seed in our mixtures, um, because that is obviously a, a woodland species, it actually takes five years from that seed to flower. So it needs five seasons basically um, to become um, a bulb and then produce enough energy to then produce a stem and a flower. So with shady areas, um, just be patient with, with the area that you do have because it might take a while for those perennial species to come through. Um, with anybody wanting information on specific mixtures, what I'll ask you to do is just email uh, which mixtures you're wanting um, to the, either the sales email or my email address, um, just because I won't be able to see this chat, I don't think, after after we've turned the um, webinar off. Um, 
So I had a question about some plants being very tall um, and would this affect the number of species developing for next year? Um, potentially, it's, it's one of those that you want to keep a balance between all the species that are there. I mean, meadows aren't a, a perfect science, really. Um, some years you will have more species thriving than others, um, and that could be due, due to how the species is, is actually um, growing. So if it's a biannual, for instance, like a wild carrot, you're only ever going to see that every other year. Um, but you want to make sure that there is areas where you haven't just got one species sort of taking over um, because it, it will stop. If it, especially if it's taller as well, it will stop light and air getting to this one. It, it basically will just outcompete anything else that's trying to, to get back um, to, to sort of grow through. So what we'd recommend is to sort of pull out um, a little bit of the species that is taking over just to give a bit more room for anything else to, to sort of come back through. Um, so I've had a question about when reducing the soil back to bare ground. Um, with when you are preparing the area, so when you are taking it back to bare ground, there's a few different ways you could do it. Um, again, spraying is is the most efficient. It will get rid of everything that is there. Um, and sometimes areas will need one or, or two sprays. So we often say to spray in the autumn and leave it over the winter period and then do another spray in the springtime just to make sure that anything that's sat in the seed bed um, that could come up to the surface after the first lot of vegetation has been removed, um, you're ensuring that you're, you're getting that stuff as well. We get asked about areas being rotivated quite a bit, which we don't often recommend because when you're rotivating, you're not actually removing um, the vegetation that's there. All you're doing is turning the soil over. And depending on how deep you go into the soil, if there is seed that is sat underneath the surface that could have been there for centuries, um, when you overturn this and bring it up to the surface, the risk is that it then gets enough light and air and then will germinate as well. So when um, if you are going to spray we, or remove what's there, we only ever say to remove sort of the very much the top surface layer, just so you're not disturbing anything that is a, a little bit deeper in the ground. Um, if you've got a lawn, for instance, so quite a flat area or a flat site, you could use a turf remover, which again will just take off that top surface of, um, of grass that's there. Um, but again, you need to be aware of any other species of seed that's been sat under there give it a couple of weeks and if nothing sort of comes through then you're normally okay um i mean quite vigorous and uh weeds will will show within sort of a week or so so you'll be able to tell whether you, you're safe to sow onto there or not hopefully that's answered that one um i think that is all the questions in the box but if i have missed any um as i said the email is on there um i hope you've all found that quite informative um, and thank you for listening. And as I said, any questions, um, just drop us an email and we'll, we'll get them all answered for you. Thanks very much.